Well, if there's one thing I've learned after watching Stoned Commander's video uh, for the first chapter of this book, Why Evolution is True, it's that uh, I gotta make it snappy. I've spent two videos and I'm only on page XVII in the introduction. So um, make it snappy, Joe. <laughs> so, so we're only gonna devote this to chapter one. What is evolution? So we're on page three, making progress. Jerry Coyne asks, what is Darwinism? And uh, he mentions this in a footnote. The modern theory of evolution is still called Darwinism, despite having gone well beyond what Darwin first proposed. This kind of epinomy is unusual in science, we don't call classical physics Newtonianism or relativity Einsteinianism. Yet, Darwin was so correct and accomplished so much in the origin that for many people, evolutionary biology has become synonymous with his name. I'll sometimes use the term Darwinism throughout this book, but keep in mind that what I mean is modern evolutionary theory. Um, uh, <laughs> bull. <laughs> There's just... No, no nicer way to say it. Um, uh, I'm sorry, but using the word Darwinism as a paying homage to the correctness of Charles Darwin, and he accomplished so much that we still call it Darwinism. Uh, a baloney, you know. Uh, Einstein was just as correct as Charles Darwin. Uh, 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 Isaac Newton was probably the most brilliant man who ever lived. Uh, Darwinism, you know, when I read that, here, here's my issue with that. When I when I read that, it it I, it seems to me that Jerry Coyne does not understand the creationist subculture that he is responding to in this book. He doesn't understand the lingo. Uh, so I don't know if he's able to communicate well with creationists. When I hear a term like Darwinism, and having been immersed in the creationist subculture for so many years, I understand what that means to them. Cre or, or Darwinism is kind of the flip side to, an, to, to creationism. Or Darwinism is what atheism uh, uh, worships. Or Darwinism is an alternate religion to Christianity. Um, all that is, is, you know, it's propaganda points, I think. It's not really true. It's baloney. But that is the creationist subculture. Those are the terms that they use. They use the word Darwinism to mean something more religious than the scientific community uh, wants to wants to wants to think. So I don't mind using the full phrase, uh, not Darwinism. I try to go out of my way not to say Darwinism. I would just as soon say uh, evolution or evolution by a natural selection, the whole thing, because that's what it is. And um, you know. Being trying trying to be sneaky and saying it's uh, Darwinism is paying homage to the guy who was so correct about it, <laughs> I'm just not buying it. So uh, anyway, I don't I don't want to I don't want to go on too much about that. Let's let's just move on. Um, Stone Commander enumerated the six points of evolutionary theory that are that are in this book. And so I'm not going to do the same thing here, but I would like to focus on <clears throat> on the last point that was brought up, and that is mutation by means other than natural selection. And I and I wish Jerry Coyne could have spent some time discussing this because I've often wondered about certain uh, animals who have features that I can't imagine how they could have come about by natural selection. And the, the example that I gave to um, Stone Commander's video is the example of creatures you find in caves who have lost their eyes. I don't understand the evolutionary benefit of an animal losing a sensory organ of any kind. I can understand modifying that sensory organ. Let's say, let's say a cave creature, let's say a, 
a, a cricket or a lizard or a fish or animals like this that enter into a cave with their eyes intact and then through generations and generations, you know, millennia, who knows how long, their ancestors have lost their eyesight. Well, there's no light in the cave. But what benefit is it to the animal having once had eyes? What benefit is, the, is it then to lose those eyes? I really don't understand that. Is it like a an efficiency of energy kind of thing? Or it seems that instead of losing the eyes, the, the eyes would instead modify to, let's say, uh, shift to a different uh, spectrum of, of uh, or uh, they would change the responsi responsivity to a different spectrum of, of light, let's say infrared. So instead of seeing sunlight bouncing off the animal or their predator or their prey, they would see instead the internal infrared heat emanating from their body if they're a warm-blooded creature. Um, something like that, I can imagine. But losing their eyesight? I don't see that, how natural selection can do that. So it seems to me that there's probably another mechanism of evolution that works tandem with natural selection or alongside natural selection. <clears throat> and I wish Jerry Coyne would have hinted at what that may be, if it's even known or if something is theorized about that. If somebody out there uh, uh, knows anything, I, I, enlighten me. I'd really genuinely like to know. That's something I've been wondering about for, for a very long time. Something that interests me a lot that I wish he could have mentioned uh, in this book. And then he gives another uh, example about evolution. He gives some diagrams in here that are really good. This one probably probably cannot see it, but it's the the evolutionary tree structure that shows the different nodes um, of common ancestry. So our ancestor, or let's say the ans common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees, for instance, probably had an opposable thumb because that's something that we have in common that's rare among other animals. Or... Um, uh, mammals such as mice, dogs, cats, along with humans and chimpanzees, uh, we have uh, placenta in common, whereas you know marsupials like kangaroos and possums do not. So our common ancestor, that is dogs, cats, mice, humans and chimps, probably had a placenta, whereas all the other animals did not. Yeah, things like that. I find that very helpful. Uh, Richard Dawkins' book, *The Ancestor's Tale*. Uh, his whole book is about that, and it's it's great. You know, the whole thing is about these these nodes in these uh, evolutionary trees of life. It's really very well done. So I like this figure. It explains what evolution is well. But he has an example of of evolution being cardboard books of matches, and I I really didn't understand that analogy. My favorite analogy of ed evolution by natural selection is is the design of automobiles or cars. And, you know, you can probably write a book about this. But just taking, for example, something really simple. The other day, GM um, is, is, is not going to be building Hummers anymore. Well, why is that? Hummers are now extinct. They're a dinosaur because their environment has changed. Gases go high, or gas prices go go high, things like that. When the when the environment uh, uh, changes, the Hummer must either modify or go extinct. Well, it has gone extinct. Whereas something like a Toyota Prius, which does fit the environment, uh, fits the environment beautifully as far as fuel economy and efficiency. Uh, However, it is still not perfect, and we see that with stuck gas pedals, and we see that with sticky floor mats and things like that. So what happens? Well, it doesn't go extinct. It's instead modified slightly, very slightly. So next year's version uh, will have those problems solved. It won't have the sticky gas pedal. Uh, the floor mat will be redesigned, things like that. So evolution of the car changes very slowly to meet 
environmental uh, conditions around it, the, 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 the desires of the people who drive, the uh, fuel prices, the environment uh, concerns, things like that. So I think the analogy of automobile design is a perfect match to the theory of evolution by natural selection in biology. Um, the, the Jerry Coyne's matchbook analogy just, I'm sorry, it went over my head. So some good things and bad things about chapter one. Uh, I guess we'll see you next time at chapter two. Take care.